so today we're going to finish up our discussion of plate tectonics by focusing in specifically on California and its plate tectonic history, its plate tectonic context. And then probably for about the last half of the lecture today, we'll start discussing marine sediments and how those sediments form and what they mean, why we should care about them and so on. So to pick up where we left off, if we look at a map of California and some of the major features that are kind of apparent even if you're looking at it at a very broad brush perspective, things like the fact that there's a San Andreas Fault, the plate boundary, a large mountain range or actually several large mountain ranges, the largest of which is the Sierra Nevada, a big valley, the Central Valley and some other features like the Salton Trough, another low-lying area in the southern end of the state. These actually all more or less reflect our plate tectonic history going back over the past several tens of millions of years. In particular, they reflect the fact that California is kind of special in that it used to be one kind of plate boundary, a convergent plate boundary, and then switched to become a different type of plate boundary, a transform boundary, over the past 30 million years or so. And I showed you some movies. I'll show them to you again. For instance, showing plate tectonic evolution of California over the past 80 million years where we are a convergent boundary. And then that convergent boundary encountered a divergent boundary within the ocean basin. North America came up against the Pacific plate for the first time. And instead of a convergent boundary, we actually developed a transform boundary. It's going through one more time. So there was the collision between two plate boundaries. And then you can see it, a little piece of California gets drawn off into the Pacific plate. Looking in more closely, Here's the collision happening. Now North America is up against the Pacific plate instead of the Farallon plate. And because of the rel relative direction of motion of those two plates, instead of having convergent boundary, we actually have more or less side-by-side -side motion and actually perhaps a little pulling apart. And so it's like California's unfolding. Okay. Convergent boundary to transform boundary and actually pulling out a little bit. So the state of California showing the outlines here is actually kind of growing outwards through its contact with the Pacific Plate. And then more closely looking at the LA Basin, we can see there's actually some interesting and compli complicated stuff going on. In particular, parts of the transverse ranges, these mountain ranges like north of Santa Barbara, including in part the Santa Monica Mountains, sort of swinging out. Okay getting captured by the Pacific Plate, which is moving off towards the Northwest, and these kind of getting spun in between the Pacific Plate and the North American Plate. And in fact, the LA Basin is a basin that essentially forms in the hole left behind when the stuff folds out, dragged by the Pacific Plate. OK, so let's look at that in a more static way. And starting with our original configuration, this, again, is an animation from Tanya Atwater and from the University of California at Santa Barbara showing the, roughly the configuration of California when it was a convergent boundary when we had seafloor, oceanic crust, lithosphere subducting underneath the west coast of North America. And in this case, it's much like the pictures I've already shown you. Okay. Oceanic crust is going down. There's sediments on the top of the oceanic crust that tend to get scraped off and just kind of piled up like snow in front of a snow plow on the edge of the North American continent. And then, of course, as the plate gets deeper and deeper, it starts to warm up. It gives off water-rich fluids. Those lower the melting temperature of the overlying mantle and lead to volcanism. So California used to be a volcanic arc. Okay. And not only was it a volcanic arc, we had a deep sea trench offshore. We had this pile of sediments getting scraped off the downgoing plate that was accumulating. And we also had this region in between the actual plate boundary and the mountains formed by volcan volcanism, sort of 100, 150 kilometers wide, that was low-lying shallow ocean. And we can actually go through and label these things in terms of what they ended up becoming in modern California. So the volcanic arc is what we now call the Sierra Nevada. That shallow sea between the deep sea trench and the volcanic arc is essentially where the Great Valley sequence, the Central Valley of California. 
Okay. And then this big pile of sediments that was being scraped off the downgoing oceanic plate, that's essentially rocks that are now found in the coast ranges, those moderate height mountains that are found west of the Great Valley, of the Central Valley of California. So think San Francisco, Diablo Range, Monterey, Big Sur. Those are all places that are essentially made out of stuff that got scraped off and piled up at the edge of the North American plate. Okay. So the great features of California, like our Sierra Nevada, here shown in a picture of Mount Whitney, the highest peak in our state. These are the roots of an ancient volcanic arc. Okay. And Mount Whitney in particular is made largely out of granite. Remember, that's kind of the characteristic rock of continental crust. Okay, it's a rock that used to be molten, rose up into the Earth's crust. Actually, in the case of a granite, it probably already contains some melted crust mixed together with those melts made from the mantle when it reacted with water and lowered its melting temperature. And so this is a, the Sierra in general is characterized by rocks that are broadly granite in composition, rocks that have crystallized from melts beneath volcanoes. And in fact, if you go north, in the Sierras today, essentially you're getting closer and closer to what used to be the surface. And if you get far enough north, you actually start to see volcanic stuff, or what used to be volcanic stuff near the tops of the volcanoes. When you're farther south and east, like in Mount Whitney, you're looking at stuff that was well under the volcanoes, several kilometers deep in the Earth's surface, and all the stuff on top of it has been eroded away over the past 80, 90 million years. So now we're actually seeing the granites that were underneath the volcanoes rather than the volcanoes themselves. Coast ranges, if you go to Big Sur or near San Francisco and see road cuts, it's very common to see really crazy patterns in the rocks like this. Or you can see stuff that just makes no sense at all. You'll just see like a big blob of one kind of rock surrounded by some completely different kind of rock. And this is because of this process of sediments getting scraped off on the edge of the North American plate as the oceanic crust was going down and just gets all wormed up because the sediments are pretty soft. Okay, and they're getting pulled down sometimes to very high pressures and then popping back up again. They're just getting put through the ringer. And so you end up with rocks that were presumably originally lying flat on the seafloor, more or less. Now it's like some giant jigsaw puzzle or avant-garde art or something. It's all squirreled up and, in fact, kind of a fool's errand in many cases to try to figure out what one bed is. They've been repeated and doubled up and wrapped around so many times. And by the way, we'll get to this later in this lecture, maybe. But in fact, the things that are making the lines you can see here in this particular case, which is from a park south of San Francisco, <clears throat> are cherts, which is a type of biogenous sediment. So these are sediments that are accumulated skeletons of micros, microorganisms in the ocean that have been lifted up onto the land and all twisted up. And they aren't that old either, a quarter, 100 million years or something like that, 150 million years. OK. So these three features, the Sierra Nevada, this big line of mountains characterized by granite, the Central Valley, and the coast ranges, or at least the rocks that constitute the coast ranges, these are leftovers. These are parts of California that derive their character from when we were a convergent boundary. Okay. Stuff being scraped off the downgoing plate, volcanic arc, and the shallow sea in between. The old active margin. Now, of course, there are younger features in California, and in particular, the San Andreas Fault, which in this very simplified picture runs from somewhat north of San Francisco, past LA, just north of us, and then almost down to the Mexican border. Actually, the San Andreas Fault and the strict sense dies somewhere in Southern California. It doesn't actually make it, to, make it over the Mexican border, but there are extensions or faults that run in the same direction that cross the border. Then once you get down into northwestern Mexico, you actually have an ocean open, opening up the Gulf of California. So we have not just a switch from a convergent boundary to a transform boundary, but in fact, farther south, just past the border, and in fact, creeping up into Southern California in the Salton Sea area, Palm Springs, Brawley, spreading. So from convergence to transform to actually divergence. So the San Andreas is a transform boundary 
broadly speaking, but it's a bit more complicated than ones we saw on the oceanic crust in Friday's lecture. This is perhaps not too surprising. Continental crust is old. It's had a really long history. There are lots of pre-existing faults and things going on. And so what happens is instead of having a simple single fault like you might see on this map, in fact, in Southern California and Northern California, there are many different faults all over the place, some of which are taking up part of the motion of North America relative to the Pacific plate, not on the San Andreas Fault. Okay, so instead of just having one fault like you see here, in fact, we have a much more complicated pattern. For instance, in Southern California, this is a map just pulled off the Southern California Earthquake Center website. Here's Los Angeles. We're right about here. Here's the San Andreas Fault shown in red, okay, running just on the other side of the San Gabriel Mountains. Okay, but all the other colored lines on here that aren't highways are other faults that are also part of this boundary between North America and the Pacific Plate. Okay, San Jacinto Fault, Newport Inglewood Fault, Santa Monica Mountains Fault, Raymond Fault, Hollywood Fault. In fact, UCLA is kind of sandwiched between two faults, the Hollywood Fault and the Santa Monica Fault. I think that's right. I may be getting that wrong, but I think that's right. Um, one of which, the Hollywood Fault actually apparently crosses through, or a strand of the Hollywood Fault crosses through the northwestern corner of UCLA's campus. So here's a map from planning documents for the Westwood, what is it, the Palazzo Westwood, which is one of these new apartment developments down in Westwood Village. And so as part of that, of course, in Southern California, on this messy transform boundary, we worry about where earthquake faults might be, because that's going to depend, that's going to affect how we build, okay, and where we let people live in Southern California. And so here's just a map of West LA with faults drawn into it. In particular, here's the Hollywood Fault, okay, which crosses right, this, by the way, is Sunset Boulevard right here. So there's a strand of the Hollywood Fault on this simplified map, which actually just cuts through up near where the dorms are. So Sierra Nevada, Coast Ranges, Great Valley, those are essentially relics of our ancient convergent boundary, San Andreas Fault, and this web of faults in Southern California, including some pretty close to us, are actually more recent phenomena. Those are properties of the transform boundary, which has formed over the past few tens of millions of years. And the San Andreas in its modern incarnation is perhaps only six or seven million years old, 12 million years old. It's been a little while since I paid attention. People were still arguing about this when I last read up on it. We're going to switch directions now and start talking about the ocean itself, starting with the things that are accumulating at the bottom of it, marine sediments, and then working on to the properties of seawater before the exam. <clears throat> and marine sediments may not sound that interesting to you, mud on the bottom of the ocean, but it turns out to be one of the best records we have of how the ocean has evolved over time and as a function of geography. And so this is a picture of people paying very close attention to marine sediments. This is a table showing drill cores drilled by a research vessel called the Chikyu, which was designed essentially to go into the ocean and drill into the ocean floor and recover sediments and other rocks from the seafloor. These cores are cylindrical. They're split in half so that you can see the middle of them. Okay? And they're pouring over them, trying to figure out what exactly is in them and what, we can, what information we can glean from looking at them most carefully. And this is actually, it turns out, I think the, some of the first cores were covered by this research vessel, which is the newest, greatest thing we have to drill in the ocean. Okay, so here's the big picture of sediments. Here's why we care. So the basic idea is that sediments are accumulating at the seafloor. They're either settling down from the ocean surface, or in fact, they're growing in place in some cases, depending on the type of sediment. And they give us a temporal record of the ocean because sediments accumulate from bottom to top. Okay, stuff is falling down more or less all the time. So what is at the surface today was stuff that fell down yesterday. What's underneath that was the stuff that fell down the day before yesterday, and so on and so forth. So as you go down in depth, you're going back in time by looking at sediments on the seafloor. And as we've just learned, the deep seafloor 
can be as old as 200 million years. That's roughly how old the o oldest oceanic crust is. And so we can look at records of stuff accumulating on the seafloor going back at least that far in the deep ocean. And in fact, if we look at continental margins that are attached to continents, we can go back farther than that. There are much older sedimentary rocks that are now part of the land or part of the continents. Okay. And since these sediments formed in the ancient ocean, if we're clever, we can figure out ways to pull out by proxy information about what that ocean was like. So we can figure out about things like what the climate used to be. What was the temperature of the ocean water? What was the weather like? Was it stormy? Was it calm? Where were the plates as a function of geological time? Was this area of the seafloor that's today near the equator once near the poles? Okay. Volcanic activity, accumulation of volcanic ash, for instance, on the seafloor. Biological evolution, over 200 million years, the organisms that are living in the ocean are changing okay, as a result of evolution. So we can actually observe the, that process of evolution occurring by looking at fossils trapped in these sediments on the seafloor. Now the fate of anything on the oceanic crust, by and large, is it's going to eventually get into contact with a convergent boundary. It's going to be scraped off on some overriding plate, or it's going to go down the tubes altogether and disappear, recycled into the deep earth. So in general, the farther back you go, the harder it is to get good records. There are many parts of the seafloor that are 60, 70, 80 million years old. We have very good records back to of order 150 million years, at least for some parts of the seafloor. The older you get beyond that, the harder it gets. You basically have to start looking at continental margins or areas where there's been a collision or some other tectonic event that's taken oceanic material and pushed it up onto the land. So it gets a little bit more difficult. But we still have partial records, at least, going back fairly deep in Earth's history. The oldest sedimentary rocks we have that we think are in some way oceanic are something like 3.8 billion years old. So if you try hard enough, you can find stuff that goes something like 80% of the way back in our history. Those rocks, by the way, if you looked at them, you wouldn't think they were sediments. They've been pretty badly cooked. They've been all squirreled up and folded, but nonetheless, We've gotten very clever, and we can try to extract some information about what ancient oceans were like by looking at those. Okay, so just to give you an example of, again, what, what the fate of many of these sediments is going to be, these are sediments that used to be on the seafloor. They used to be flat-lying, nice orderly succession, and now, of course, it's all folded up and munged up on the shore south of San Francisco. Okay, so where are sediments in the ocean? By and large, sediments are actually pretty close to the continents. The vast majority by volume, by mass, of sediments on the seafloor have accumulated at continental margins, okay, which make up not very much of the ocean by area, but a lot of the oceanic sediment budget by volume and by mass. Great thicknesses of sediments accumulated particularly at passive margins where sediments are just building up over time where you have a transition from continental crust to oceanic crust. When you get away from the continents into the deep ocean, in general, sedimentation is much slower and the accumulation of sediment is much less, an order of magnitude less, factor of 10, something like that. So from many kilometers deep to often a few hundred meters deep or even less than that in some parts of the ocean that have never been close to a continent. Okay, so the story of the distribution of sediment in the ocean is very inhomogeneous. There's lots of sediment near the shores, much less as you get farther away. And we can think of sediments, this is, you can think of this as being one possible way to kind of classify sediments. There are margin sediments that accumulate near continents in great volume, and there are deep sea sediments that accumulate well away from continents and generally are much sparser. Which is actually a good thing going back to this picture. I actually don't know if these are margin sediments or deep sea sediments, so I can't say that for sure. But of course, if you wanted to drill back to 200 million year sediments, probably you don't want to go to a continental margin, at least not as your first try, because <laughs> if you have to go through seven and a half kilometers of stuff, that's a lot of drilling. Okay? But if you go to the deep ocean, it's a few hundred meters. That's actually no big deal to drill through. I'm simplifying, of course. It's harder to drill through deep water than it is to drill through shallow water, so there are complications. Okay, so you can think of that as being one way of thinking about sediment classification. 
Is it close to a continent? Is it associated with a continent? Or is it not? Perhaps an even more straightforward way to think of classifying sediments on the seafloor is according to particle size. And in your book and in your lab, we, we do our best to confuse you, I'm afraid, because you'll see slightly different classification schemes for size. I'm giving you a somewhat simplified version, which I think roughly corresponds to what's in the book and in your lab, but it may not be perfect. Um, and that is, by size, we can divvy up sediments according to the sizes of the individual particles that make up that sediment. So we can think of the coarsest type of sediment as being equivalent to gravel or granules or pebbles. Of course, there are bigger grains than that. If you go out to one of these rivers in the mountains, you'll find boulders, which are a form of sediment, but those are relatively rare. I'm just going to lump those all together into things that are bigger than, say, a couple millimeters in size and call that gravel, granules, and pebbles. Hopefully, you have a rough intuitive sense of how big a millimeter is by now. 25, 26 millimeters is one inch, okay, so a good pebble size. You can think of peas in a pod as being examples of things that are gravel sized a few millimeters across. The next smallest size is sand, which hopefully is also familiar to you. Technically, we define sand as any sediment that has particles in size between about 1 16th of a millimeter and 2 millimeters. Rule of thumb, you can think of this as being something that's small, of order a millimeter, but is big enough that you can see an individual particle with your naked eye, okay, without too much struggle. Okay, so think of, of granulated sugar or table salt. Those are all good examples of things that are sand size. And of course, beach sand or dune sand are also good examples of sand. Next most fine is silt. Those are particles ranging in size from about 4 one millionths of a meter to about 60 one millionths of a meter. Unless you carry a micrometer around with you, that may not be very helpful. But a more direct way to get a sense of what silt is, and you'll get to do this in your lab next week, is that silt grains you can think of as particles that are fairly difficult to see with your naked eye. In some cases, you could see them like if you have a light particle and a dark background, you might be able to make out individual particles, but more generally, it's going to be difficult to do so. But you can still feel them. You can feel grittiness of individual particles if you roll the sediment around in your fingers. The classical geologist test is actually to put it in your mouth and see if you can taste it with your teeth. Teeth are very good at picking up gritty things. I wouldn't recommend doing that, but I won't stop you if you insist to try. And perhaps more prosaically, you can think of powdered sugar, confectioner sugar, like you might find on a powdered donut, as being particles that are roughly silt sized. Okay, and again, you can probably, if you try hard enough, see individual particles of granulated sugar. It's going to be tough. Okay, but you can still feel a little grittiness when you take confectioner sugar and grind it between your fingers, just a little bit. And then finally, clay particles are the finest of all, less than four one millionths of a meter across. There's no way you're going to see an individual clay particle. In fact, it's very difficult to see them even under a normal optical microscope, okay, because the wavelength of light is a fraction of a micron. These aren't much more than a micron, so you're talking about particles that are roughly the same size as the light you're trying to use to see them with. Usually, to get a good picture of something that's clay-sized, in fact, you need to use an electron microscope. And we'll start seeing, when we look at biological sediments, lots of electron microscopy sides, because that's the best way to make pictures of these things. And so there's nothing really I could show you a picture of that's clay that would be recognizable, but the closest I can come is the toner in a laser printer. And this would actually be fairly high-grade toner in a pretty new, fancy laser printer. Laser printers have pigment particles that are actually used to assemble the things you're printing. Okay, And there's a melting and recrystallization process that happens as well, at least in some laser printers. And so the size, the smallest size of thing that you can make a picture of with a laser printer is going to depend on the size of the particles the laser printer is using to make that picture. Okay, if you have particles that are a millimeter across, you're going to have trouble making pictures that have features that are half a millimeter across because an individual spot of pigment is going to be a millimeter across. So there's actually a technological imperative to make very fine particles for use in laser printing or for making photocopies. So we've actually gotten very good at making clay-sized or smaller particles for use in laser printing. And so you can think of the toner in a laser printer as being an example of something. Because we want it to be very small, we've actually figured out how to engineer it 
so that it's clay sized. Is that making sense? I know I'm going a little faster than I intended to. All right. So following on in this idea that we can classify sediments not just by where they occur, but also what size they are, What's the point in that? Well, it actually turns out that if we understand how big the grains in a sediment are, that tells us quite a bit about how the sediment got to be where it is, okay, what its history was before deposition. And in particular, one aspect that's use, useful to pay some attention to is whether all the particles in a particular sediment are the same size. This is an idea of sorting. Okay, you can think of sorted sediment as being a sediment where all the particles are more or less the same size. That implies that some process has occurred, at least in the case of rocky sediments, that has sorted them, gotten rid of the big ones, gotten rid of the little ones, so that all that's left over are ones that are in the middle somewhere. Okay. And so a sediment where all the grains are about the same size, the implication is that this is a sediment that's been through some lengthy process of winnowing, okay? removing fine particles, transporting away from bigger particles, and so that all that's left is material that's been sorted by size, by its ease of transport, or by the rate at which it falls through the water column to accumulate as sediment on the seafloor. Okay, so here are a couple pictures. This is a picture of some sand. This is actually, I think, dune sand from Utah. And here's river gravel from Arizona. Would you call this well-sorted sediment? Yeah, these pic particles are pretty much all the same size. This is actually remarkably well-sorted. This is, I spent some time looking for really good examples of sorting. This is the best one. Things that don't look nearly this nice, we would still call pretty well-sorted. What about this one? Well-sorted or not? Not, right? We have really big pebbles. We have little sand grains. They're all kind of jobbed together. So this is a well-sorted sediment. This is a poorly sorted sediment. And in fact, from that just textual observation, we can say, aha, these sediments have been transported a while under more or less consistent conditions such that we've accumulated only particles of a certain size. And in fact, this is pretty common for dune sand. Okay, it's being blown by the wind Wind is not very substantial. It can't move big particles very easily. Okay, so big grains like these gravels are just going to get left behind. They're not going to move at all. Okay, and wind can also pick up dust, of course. And so as the grains are moving along under the action of the wind, the dust is going to get lofted away and just blow miles away. It's not going to end up in the same place that the sand does. And so dune sands are commonly very well sorted. Well, that's not an oceanographic process. But you can imagine an equivalent oceanographic process, like on a beach, okay, where you have waves washing up and washing down, washing up and washing down, washing up and washing down, day after day after day. Okay, big particles that are too big to get moved by that wave action won't get moved at all. Really tiny particles may end up in suspension in the water and get moved offshore. And over time, you end up with a very well-sorted beach sand. Okay? Beach sands and dune sands are commonly very well-sorted. And if you see a very well-sorted sand in some seafloor sediment, that's a good, good indication that you were, that sand formed under conditions where there was constant flow, a consistent flow over some significant period of time. Okay. This is a river sand or a river gravel. Okay. In Arizona, rivers tend to not run constantly. Okay. They kind of run when there's a storm and then they stop because it's a desert. So this is perhaps not a bad example of episodic transport of sediment. And the fact that it's poorly sorted, it gives you some evidence that, in fact, this is an episodic, really energetic events will come through and then they'll stop. And this is also a good example of a poorly sorted sediment telling us that the source of this sediment, the rocks from which these grains are being eroded, probably isn't that far away. Okay, in this case, the rocks from which these are being eroded is just upstream a little ways. Okay? So if you see a very poorly sediment, sorted sediment on the seafloor, that's piece of evidence, aha, perhaps there is some erosion happening very close by where right near the 
continental margin or we're right where a river is entering into the ocean that just eroded off the mountains somehow. Okay, so from the sorting of sediments, we can get an idea of whether they're being deposited under sort of steady state, moderate flow conditions or whether it's episodic and you're very close to the area where the sediment is being formed in the first place. Okay, and these happen to be land examples, but you could see the same kind of example, sorting of shells in shelly environments, sorting of particles of eroded coral in coral sands, and so on and so forth. It's almost a ubiquitous process wherever uh, sediment grains are being transported by flow. I had wanted at this point to stop and give you a, an example of, in fact, how what I just told you is somewhat of an oversimplification. And that is, I've sort of said, oh, this must have been transport over a large distance or over a long period of time. This must be a fairly short distance and not very long period of time. Turns out, actually, that water is really, really good at sorting stuff. You can sort out grains by size very efficiently without very much water. And when I come on, on Wednesday, hopefully I'll have a chance to get this set up for you, I'll actually show you just how easy it is to take sediments and sort them by grain size using water. To give you a little bit of a preview of that, this is a video of a debris flow underwater from the University of Wyoming uh, Archive of Sedimentary Processes. So that is clearly an energetic process, right? We have this big cloud just shooting across from right to left, your right to left. Okay, obviously a chaotic process. This is, by the way, in a lab. So in fact, the sediment is coming from like right here. It's transported a distance of like a meter, not very far. It's not like miles or something like that. And yet, in this movie, you can see sorting occurring. And if you look closely, what you can see is when this thing first goes by, it's just a mix of all kinds of stuff. But then you can see that there's stuff on the bottom. And then there's also fine grained stuff that's still suspended in the water. So already, even in this very energetic, very short distance flow, there's a basic grain size separation occurring where the coarsest stuff is flowing along the bottom and the fine grain stuff is staying in suspension. You can imagine if this kept flowing, well, what would you imagine? What would be, if you found a deposit in the ocean that had formed by a process that's like, like this, what might you expect to see? If you had a debris flow or a turbidity current that was flowing downhill, okay, very energetic, and then it stopped at some point because it just ran out of room or ran out of hill to run down. What might be left in the sedimentary record? Okay, so you might see a submarine canyon. In fact, that's probably how some submarine canyons form is by these kinds of flows. Okay, but what might be the deposit left over after the flow? I'm sorry? You can get a submarine fan? Okay. One instance. What if you had just one flow and it was this thick? What might you see after the fact in terms of the structure of that deposit? Which particles are going to be ones that are going to stop moving first? The big ones. Which ones are going to be the particles that stop moving last? And if a sedimentary deposit is oldest at the bottom and youngest at the top, what might you expect the structure of that deposit to be if the coarse stuff stops first and the finer stuff stops later? Yeah, that's exactly right. You would see an deposit that was coarse material at the bottom because that's the stuff that stopped first and then gets finer and finer as you get towards the top. Right? So you would expect in that case to see a bed, an individual depositional event recorded in sediment that was graded. It went from coarse at the bottom to fine at the top. Okay. And in fact, that's the characteristic feature of these deposits of turbidity and debris flow deposits is this kind of coarse at the bottom, fine at the top structure. So when you see those on the seafloor, you can say, aha, this is presumably deposited by some flow under the water. Okay. And in general, that rule, by the way, holds coarse stuff is the hardest to transport, requires the most energy, the fastest flows, the steepest slopes, the biggest rivers. Okay? Sand in the middle 
can be moved around by gentle waves. It can be moved around by you know, relatively quiescent rivers that are still flowing. And then clays, they can actually be suspended in the water column and transported even in fairly quiet conditions. And they can be transported over large distances in the ocean or in the rivers. Okay, so in microcosm within one deposit, you can see a gradation from coarse stuff to fine stuff over the course of one depositional event. And then on a broad scale, geographically, you can see the same grading from coarse stuff near a sediment source to finer stuff the farther away you get and the quieter the conditions get. So just to show you an example, this is an example of a graded bed. Okay? And there are actually several graded beds here. And what you can see is, hopefully you can see this. It's not. I've never really found a really good picture of this, but you can definitely, I hope, see that there are some pretty big chunks down here, right? Big sediments. By the way, this is a lens cap, a few centimeters across to give you a sense of scale. So obviously, this is blown up. And as you get closer and closer to the top of this one bed, it's getting finer and finer grained. And then it gets sort of sand sized grains. And then it starts over again really coarse stuff, finer, finer, finer. Really coarse stuff, finer, finer, finer. You're seeing a, lay, a series of graded beds, one on top of the other. The implication being, in this case, that this is something like one flow event, one depositional event, where the coarse stuff is coming out first, and then progressively finer stuff, and then it's stopping as the flow slows down, or the sediment source stops giving off sediment. And then it starts over again, then it starts over again. So you can think of this as being, OK, this is one turbidite. One turbidity current, another turbidity current, another turbidity current, one debris flow, another debris flow, another debris flow, one storm, another storm, another storm, one on top of the other. So here we're just looking at how big the grains are on a rock, but we're already inferring some event that occurred in the past, some violent or uh, significant flow event that occurred in the past, just by looking at grain size. Um, I'm speaking more or less in generalities. So in principle, these are, things, these are ideas that you could apply anywhere you found sediment accumulating. Where you would go to look will depend on what kind of event you're interested in. So if you're interested in understanding when storms are occurring, for instance, you're not going to go to the deepest parts of the ocean in general because storms are blowing across the surface of the ocean that are disturbing the upper a few hundred meters, probably even less than that, of the ocean surface. A sediment that's accumulating 100 um, kilometers below the surface of the ocean doesn't even know that there's a storm happening, by and large. So you wouldn't see something like this happening you know, in the middle of an abyssal plain. But you might see it if you were in a continental shelf that was tens of meters deep, where the storm waves were stirring up the sediment and causing these sort of transport events to occur. If you are looking for turbidity currents, which are flowing down a deep sea canyon or a deep sea fan, you wouldn't want to be looking right up near the ocean surface because it's going to be getting disturbed by river flood and flooding events and storms. There are lots of other processes that happen there that might give you confusing or conflicting things or just wipe out any evidence of those kinds of events when they occur. So you might go into sort of the continental slope area or the continental rise where those flows are kind of running out and eventually stopping and depositing their load. So where you go to find particular evidence for different types of events depends on what kind of event you're looking for. You want to find an area that's, of course, appropriate in terms of its depth and flow regime, flow environment for the type of deposit, the type of event you want to detect in the record. Any other questions? OK, so we talked about where they occur. We've talked about classification by size and how, how that makes, how that implies something about the energy conditions or the distance over which things are being transported in the ocean. Finally, we can classify sediments according to where they come from, where, what process causes the particles to form in the first place that are accumulating a sediment. And for the purposes of this class, we're going to divvy up into four types. Terrigenous sediments, which is pretty much what I've been showing you pictures of so far. Those are sediments that actually are probably what you normally think of when you think of sediments. 
formed by weathering of continental rocks. Okay? And we can expand this a little bit to include volcanic rocks in places like Hawaii. We might call those terrigenous sediments even though they aren't really forming on a continent. It's forming on, by a land process or a volcanic process. And so we're looking at bits and pieces of rocks that have been broken down by the weather, they've been broken down by thermal cycling, and they've been transported somehow into the ocean, either by wind or by rivers or by some other process of flowing material, by debris flows or by landslides even. There are biogenous sediments. Those are sediments that come fundamentally from a biological source. So can anybody think of an example of a biological process that generates particles that might accumulate on the seafloor? Yeah, so a fossil is kind of an example of a biogenous sediment. In particular, a fossil would be fairly old and it would have been undergone some kind of alteration process to become a fossil, but it's an example of a biological remain that has been incorporated into the rock record. Oh, actually, that's, yes, so. Uh, mentioning parrotfish, which are an example of an organism that actually eats rock to first order. It's not actually interested in the rock for, it's trying to get the organic material that's attached to the rock, but it actually consumes a certain amount of rock in coral reef environments, grinds it up, and excretes it in the form of coral sand. This is one of the ways that coral sand gets formed. That's actually Interesting. Yes, you would call that a biogenous sediment. I suppose that's true. Actually, it turns out that the coral reef in the first place is an example of a biogenous sediment. So it's a biogenous sediment that's been broken up by another organism. So it's like doubly biogenous. But in general, just shells okay, are examples of biogenous sediments. Okay. Or you know, leaves or wood that are accumulating on the seafloor. Okay, these are all examples of biogenous sediments. Hydrogenous sediments are those sediments that precipitate more or less directly from seawater. Sometimes we call these authogenic, genic meaning like genesis, so origin, autho meaning in this case in place. So these are sediments that form where they're located, okay, or at least forming from the seawater. Anybody have an example of a hydrogenous sediment forms by chemical precipitation from seawater? If you were to go out to Santa Monica up here and scoop up a bucket of seawater and just let it sit outside for a few weeks in the summer, what would happen to it? Yeah, you would get salt crystals, right? So salt crystals would be an example of an orthogenic sediment, where if you evaporate seawater, it in fact starts to crystallize. It makes new crystalline material from the seawater directly. Those would be examples of orthogenic hydrogenous sediments. The scale that forms on the inside of your teapot, okay, particularly in Los Angeles where we have quite a bit of dissolved stuff in our drinking water, that is another example of a hydrogenous sediment. Okay. In that case, it's not forming from seawater, obviously, it's forming from tap water, but it's the same basic process. Okay. And then finally, cosmogenous sediments, which usually volumetrically aren't very important in the ocean, but when they occur, they can occur in great volume and suddenness. Okay. Um, and they can accumulate very slowly in the ocean and turn out to be really important for tracing certain processes that occur in the ocean. But the first, first order, you can think of an example of a cosmo cosmogenous sediment event as being like a meteorite comes in and hits the ocean. Okay? That's a very energetic event. Even large particles are going to be prone to be moved around by that sort of violent flow. And so you're going to redistribute sediment across the seafloor, at least some part of it. And that would be an example of a sedimentary process that's ultimately derived from an event in outer space, and so that would be a cosmogenous sediment. Okay. So we're going to start by talking about terrigenous sediment sources, and then we're going to spend quite a bit of time actually on biogenous sediment sources, which turn out to be really interesting. But just to give you a sense of terrigenous sediment sources, You've seen them, okay? Whenever you go out to a muddy puddle or you see a picture of the old Colorado River before it all got dammed up and was running brown, those are all examples of terrigenous sediment being transported towards the ocean. Here are a couple of pictures of really big 
sediment transport events on the Earth's surface today. This is the Amazon River and the Rio Negro near the M uh, Brazilian town of Manaus. Okay, and you can see all this material being transported from the Andes down to the seafloor, down to the, sorry, the seashore in South America. This is the outlet of the Brahmaputra and Ganges River in Bangladesh, draining the Himalayan mountains, so these big mountains that are being pushed up and worn down by water erosion, and all this brown terrigenous sedimentary material is being delivered to the Bay of Bengal in this case. So when we come back on Wednesday, we'll talk about how this material is distributed along the ocean margins, where it goes in the ocean, and then we'll spend the rest of the hour talking about biogenous sediments. <laughs>